It's a lovely day, and we're outside, and Tucker Mountain is in the offing. What's not to like? <laughs> Welcome to Windows to the Wild. I'm Willem Lang. Well, as you can see, spring has finally returned to the beautiful state of Vermont. The trees are budding, the birds are coming back, and I'm here in Newbury, Vermont today with a very dear old friend, Gary Moore. Gary, a pleasure. How you been? I've been fine, able to take nourishment, so <laughs> I'm happy to be out here today. Yeah, isn't it nice after a winter with COVID-19? knocking on the door to be able to get out with friends. It sure is. Yeah. Now, where are we? We're on the uh, west side of Newbury. We're going to be heading up to Tucker Mountain, Yeah. Uh, which is, has beautiful views of not only the great state of Vermont, but the great state of New Hampshire. Now, along the way, we're going to meet some of our old friends, right? That is correct. They're going to be up uh, near the top. They're coming up from the other side. Ah, okay. okay, let's go. Tucker Mountain sits in the middle of the Tucker Mountain Town Forest in eastern Vermont. If you can get to Newberry, you'll find it. It's just shy of 1,700 feet in elevation. Gary is a friend from way back. Like me, he loves being outdoors. These days we get together only every now and then, so it's nice to hike with him today. Kiki and Oak seem happy too. <laughs> oh, don't shake. <laughs> Meet my very well-trained dog. He can't help it. <laughs> you say this was cleared as early as the early 1800s? Yes, yes. Wow. Yes. And they, they, they came here because the bottom land was all taken, right? Right. Uh, yeah. The f original settlers to Newbury, like so many of the towns in the valley, obviously they, they wanted to be near the river where the good soil was. And, yeah. But as those places got taken up, uh, you know, the land, they had to move to higher elevations, and that's how they got up here to West Newbury and oh, yeah. ultimately up here to Tucker Mountain. It took a long time. Jason and Trish Vaudry are with us. Last spring, they were the high bidders on NHPBS's auction, so they get to spend the day with the film crew. It's great to meet new faces, even at a socially safe distance. Jason. Yes. Vaudry, you're a nurse. I am. Yolo. <laughs> <laughs> So you're what we call a frontline worker, right? Yes, I am. And your specialty is? Well, my specialty is geriatrics and behavioral health. So right, up, I, right up my alley. That's I, great. I spend a lot of time working with the elderly that have dementia and uh, other diseases like that. Oh, yeah. Awful thing. Oh, dear. Yes. Now, has the pandemic made a difference in your life? It's made a difference in my life personally and professionally. Yeah. Um, personally, of course, we can't go as many places as we're used to going. Um, professionally, part of my job, I also, I assess the residents quarterly. And part of that assessment is um, checking their depression. Ah. And over the past uh. year, the amount of depression that we've seen in the nursing home has skyrocketed simply because family members can't come in to visit and they, you know, they even have, it's been where they can't even sit at a table and have lunch together because they have to be distanced and everyone for a while actually had to remain in their own rooms. Yeah. The other hikers we'll meet are on their way up the other side of the mountain. 
We'll pick them up along the trail. The three of them are known as the caretakers of the town forest. Tom Kidder, John and Tom, Caroline yeah, Ninager, Tom, Tom Kidder, yeah. and a couple others of the, of a, they were appointed by the select board uh, to be uh -huh. in charge. Although they, uh, they were very active bef even before the town took it over and uh, trying to preserve it. So yes, yeah. Yeah. much of what we've seen today is because of them and the volunteers they've organized. And deliverance. <laughs> Kiki and Oak check out our hiking partners. Tom Kidder is the chair of the Tucker Mountain Town Forest Management Committee. John Nininger is the vice chair. Caroline Nininger is a dedicated volunteer. How many acres in this Tucker Mountain Town Forest? 636 acres. Wow, yeah. that many? Yeah. Whoa, and that was one that was one private holding at one time. It was actually uh, two members of the same family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ted Leach and his father, Phil, and his wife, uh, they Jenny. Would, Phil and Jenny Leach own most of this. They bought it because back in the 70s because it was someone was planning on developing it and they wanted to buy it and protect it. Yeah. And so they bought up more and more acres and then their son bought some acres over here by Woodcheck Mountain and, yeah. and then they decided to, they decided to um, sell it to the town at half the assessed value. Old stone walls wind their way around the town forest, a reminder that this was once a part of the town's agricultural history. But that was a long time ago. Nature reclaimed the land. I like the, the light green stuff that's coming up around the rocks. That's really pretty. Lamb's ears, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is it? Lamb's ears, I think. Oh, okay. yeah. You can see the stone walls there, and over when we saw this, uh, you couldn't see those three years ago. <laughs> they were completely uh, grown up in brush. Yeah. Like so many of the back pastures in Vermont and New Hampshire, yeah. Yeah. Uh, once uh, dairying changed and no longer pastured young stock back and dry cows back on the hills, they quickly grew up to uh, brush and then ultimately trees. Yeah. Volunteers removed a lot of brush. They laid out and marked the trails and put up beautiful information kiosks. Most of it is volunteer. Yes, it's almost all volunteer, and the volunteers have been incredible. They just come forward like we've never expected. I think. Are these the all, first, all local, all Newburyites? Almost all. Huh. Yeah. We had the first year we had over 80 volunteers. Wow. And last year was around 50. Yeah. But with COVID, that slowed things down, especially community service uh, projects yeah. from the schools and things like that. Uh, brought our numbers down. But so COVID did have an effect on this, in out, terms even though of it's... volunteering. Yeah, we didn't organize as many projects as we. Half yeah. a year before, and I think the big difference was, with COVID, we didn't have the community service projects where you get a, you know, a, uh, the elementary staff of 20 people up here working. Has the pandemic affected at all? Are you all able to get outdoors? My perception has been. Uh, the pandemic has meant more people coming up to see it. Uh, uh -huh. People that never hiked in the past seem to be hiking not just here, but as you know, on some, a lot of the other trails. Uh, so I think COVID may actually help in that more people will see this and appreciate what uh, that committee of, of volunteers has done. So places like this during the pandemic, like the one we're having and have just had, uh, become more important, you think? I think it's, it, it has, and we've seen a, probably more use as a result of the pandemic because it's close. 
Yeah. People who love to hike, they've, they've been getting out a lot more during the pandemic because there's not a whole lot they can do indoors. Yeah. But rather than drive an hour and a half or two hours over to the White Mountains, you know, this might be 15 minutes away, half an hour away for our locals, and they, they're up here. I mean, we have hikers that are regulars. They come once or twice a week. Yeah. And we'll see them up here. One, one woman comes up here every Sunday morning. She says, it's my church. <laughs> and she never fails. She and her dog are up here. I believe uh, having a place close to the residents of the town that they can go to recreate. They cross-country ski up here. They hike up here. Oh, uh, yeah. Picnic here. Uh, I think that's important. So for most most people, uh, the pandemic it meant social distancing, keeping away from other people, but you could always get outdoors, couldn't you? That, that's true, and a lot of people did. Uh, you, know. you could socially distance on the trails. Yep. Uh, a lot of people came up here. Yeah. Uh, I also hike uh, the next one down, as you know, Wrights Mountain, yep. several times a year, and I would see people there. Many people I would talk to, They'd never been there or here before, but ah. because because of COVID and being cooped up, they, you know, short yeah. of going crazy, it was a lot better to get out and take a walk, right. uh, yeah. use a little energy, get some fresh air. Yeah, this one, and I every day Hubbard Park, yeah, a couple of miles, which is nice, you know, yeah. hills and woods and everything. And you could still see people and keep your distance and yeah. be safe and have a <laughs> conversation, you know. Although a lot of Vermonters with their masks on, they see me coming. They don't know I've had my shots and everything, you know, but they kind of go, and they they step back into the woods and kind of watch me go by. I know what they, mean. <laughs> they think, where have I seen that picture? In the post office or on Windows to the Wild? Which was it? Getting outdoors is incredibly valuable because everyone is so focused on the news and so focused on everything that's going oh, on in the yeah. world which you know, there's been so much lately that has not been positive, yeah. that by being able to get outdoors, get the fresh air, it's a nice distraction from the rest of the things going on in the world yeah. today. Sure. Now you're a photographer too, right? I try to be. Yeah. I'm still in, you know, I'm in search of that elusive, perfect photograph. Well, it's, you know, <laughs> it's the same in fishing and golf, you know. Absolutely. It, it doesn't change at all. Uh, You'll get it, you'll get it. <laughs> Jason mentioned that he cares for people living with dementia. The pandemic has kept a lot of people inside. So I was curious, does it help them to get outside at all? Absolutely, in fact, we have an enclosed garden off of there where the residents can go out. We've got raised flower beds so they can pick the flowers, smell the flowers, sit outside in the sun. Oh, that's great. So I brought the trail over here to, because of this lovely little drainage here, which is really beautiful right now. I like crystal clear water and the moss. Mossy rock. Yeah. It's nice to be thinking local. And I think even with, you know, uh, the, the issues with carbon consumption and not driving three miles or three hours to get someplace, but just look in your own backyard. You're going to find something precious like this. Yeah. Even if it's not a town forest, there's plenty of woods and wilderness around to explore. Yeah. Climate change is, you look into a forest like this where there's death and destruction, there's debris, yeah. you know, and I used to be of the mind, let's clean it up. Let's get rid of all that stuff and make it look like a park. Mm -hmm. But actually there's probably more life in there now in those dead logs. There's funguses and microorganisms and there's tons of things going on in there that are sequestering carbon. and putting it back in the soil and it's it's all of a sudden I'm taking a whole nother viewpoint on the matter <laughs> instead of wanting to cut trees I want to leave the forest alone
it's amazing how much new information is coming out every day. And that's one thing about COVID that's been remarkable is all these Zoom webinars and things about managing forests and managing town forests and managing oh, yeah. doing trail work and, and logging and carbon sequestration. So it's, it's really exciting, all this new information. This is a legacy birch. It's a beautiful old birch tree. It just happened to blow down. We decided, let's not cut it, let's make it into a bench. And let's bring the trail around the base of the stump. Mm. And, uh, and then, then I found this thing, and it had a branch on it. I stuck it in here and notched this. This is just sitting here. So. But go ahead and try it out. Oh, nice. <laughs> oh, this. This was private land. A good owner who let people use it. That's correct. Oh, but he was going to sell it, and you didn't know to whom. So the, the Nature Conservancy bought it and held on to it until the town was able to vote. That is correct, yes. To take it over. Uh, real concerned that it would be purchased and put off limits to the public. Uh, yeah. Uh, and it takes time to to get support in the town, that took time to get support from the town to purchase it. Well, Luckily, England, the, you know, uh, right. You can't do nothing right away. The uh, <laughs> Nature Conservancy <laughs> stepped in and purchased it until the town yeah. came. Uh, we have some forests on this property that are close to old growth forests as well. And we're just leaving it for another 10 years at the recommendation yeah. of our forester. We're not gonna touch it. Um, and to see what happens, see what it becomes. It's beautiful to see that transition. And it's the, we should give a lot of credit to the previous owners, the Leach family, who did very careful, conscientious forest management. Okay. <laughs> Just step there right there. Just leave it. Anybody wants to hike here, y'all have got a website, right? Yes. We yes. Do. Mm -hmm. uh, they can just Google Newbury Town Forest. Tucker Town right? Forest. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Tucker Mountain yeah, Town. Tucker Mountain That's Town right, Forest. Tucker Mountain. Okay. Tucker Mountain Town Forest. Town Forest. And and org. It'll show people where the <laughs> entry points are, mm -hmm. and that's where your key kiosks are with those fantastic maps. They're really good. Mm -hmm. To have people come and use these trails and enjoy them. It's it's just so fun to, right, to be in it right from the very beginning. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. I'm glad you've done it. Mm -hmm. You don't mind if I come over now and then and walk no, my dog? No, no. Please do. Please <laughs> do. Love Let it. us know when you're coming. We'll walk it with you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's been a lot of fun to make all these discoveries here and there. Something new is always coming along. Um, in this case, a couple of trees that are wrapped into an embrace. It's time to say goodbye today before we split up here forever, perhaps. I want to thank everybody who showed up today. Tom, John, Caroline, not you. <laughs> Gary, Jason, and Trish. We've had a great climb and a great time. We've got to split up now because people have different places to go. Plus which, we're going to take you down the river a little bit where Scott Ellis and some of his students are observing a little ritual of the season. everybody to the Thetford Academy Sugar Bush. It's uh, late March here, which means it's sugar in season. And uh, Thetford Academy, we are doing a really cool thing where we're tying maple sugaring to our science and our ecology and our natural history. And kids are coming out here and making maple syrup, but they're also learning some really valuable lessons uh, along the way. And uh, it's getting a little late, but this one's still dripping just a little bit. This student's doing a really interesting lab experiment where they're testing different size spouts or spiles. 
Um, and so they actually custom made this spile and then they have ones of smaller and smaller diameter and they've tried to tap similar trees to see if the spile diameter actually affects the amount of sap. And uh, what we found is this larger one is actually producing quite a bit more. So he's getting some really good data along the way to say, yeah, spile size does affect how much sap you're gonna get. I like being outdoors. It's also, you know, very nice. And knowing about trees is good because it's just something that the where we live, it's all trees. Mm -hmm. So you want to know if you do anything with them, how to do it right and keep everything alive and well. Um, so I'm curious, Max, like there's this sugar in the trees that's all about this maple, right? Can you explain like, what, how do we get, the, where's the sugar from? What's going on with this movement of sap in the tree? Well, so trees have roots and a trunk and the canopy where the leaves are. And so the roots get nutrients like, you know, just general nutrients that the tree needs to do photosynthesis. And there are things in the tree called xylem that are just big long tubes all the way up through the tree that'll bring the nutrients to the leaves where those will make sugar and distribute it out through the tree. Cool. And then there's the phloem that goes down, right? Yeah. So xylem up, phloem down. And so the it's really flowing through those sugars in the trees, right? Yeah. And where did all the sugars come from? Like, where what's, what's the tree doing with these sugars? Why does it have them, you know? Well, it stores them mm -hmm. to keep it alive. Yeah. And it needs them to just live like anyone else does with food. Yeah, you imagine right now as they open up in spring, how much energy it takes to put all those leaves out again and everything. So these trees have really held on to those sugars all winter. Yeah. And they we're just taking a little bit right now, right? Are we hurting the tree? No. So what does it have to do for the sap to run? If this is a seasonal thing this time of year, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The sap has to be, it has to be, uh, the night before has to be, it has to be frozen. So, yeah. yeah, cool. So freezing night, warm during the day, that's the ideal time to get a run, right? Yeah. And it's only this time of year that it happens. Yeah. You've signed up for this experiential environmental studies outdoor education class here with your last few months as a senior. What do you hope to get out of this whole experience and why are you here? Well, I mean, like so much of high school has been, you know, doing like science classes, like physics, chemistry, doing like math. And so, you know, with my last, uh, last couple months, as you said, at, at TA, I really want to do something more hands-on. You're doing a cool lab down there as well, right? Yep. So you're trying to test something in the sugar bush. Explain to me, what, what are you trying to test out there? Yeah, so I, I've hung up some uh, 5 16 line and some 3 16 um, and we're gonna see what collects more sap. Oh, cool. And yeah, it was, it was the other day I went down with a, a drill and first time really going down into the woods with a drill. <laughs> and I had to FaceTime one of my friends, like how does, how do I get the drill bit out of the drill? How do you put a drill bit in, um, yeah? But yeah, that was, I think that's like the biggest part, like just learning all this new stuff. And That's uh, a lesson, you know, yeah, like exactly. you gotta know how to put a drill bit in a drill. Yes. Right? They know, that's not in every class, but yep. that's in this class and you learned how to do that. And you, yep. you're gonna remember that the rest of your life. Exactly. Right? Cool. Let me listen. Let me listen to the world. Let me listen to the beat of your heart, the wind blowing, the trembling glass, grass, crickets. How do you listen to the stars, the moon? Do you listen to eyes? Let me listen to the silence that comes after the question asked too many times. Let me listen to your footsteps as you walk away into the dark. I listen to my own as I follow. Let me listen to the fox scream in the distance while the campfire crackles and our silence is deafening once again. Let me listen to your slow breaths and your whispers of an unwanted sorry. So Sadie, um, so you've been doing some research on this thing called the maple borer, right? Mm -hmm. What is this maple borer thing? So the maple borer is an insect that is native to North America, and um, it digs tunnels through the um, vascular system of the maple tree. And I'm so like in here, it's underneath the bark right and everything, digging tunnels. And so I'm trying to figure out if it affects the amount of sap that is collected during triggering season. Yeah, so um, if you get a lot of these insects, is it gonna hurt your trees really? 100%. What do you, what do you yeah. think? Does it hurt the trees? Oh yeah, definitely. It, after a while, it kills the tree and Really one of the only ways to stop it from spreading is to take the whole tree out of the grove. Okay. So 
this style of education is different, right? Like, mm -hmm. how, what is the value to you of learning this way? I think that even if it's not a career path that I want to take, it still is good knowledge to have, just like, and also this class kind of teaches you not only about uh, the environment and triggering, but also a little bit about life. And it kind I just think it's an important part of school that we don't usually get. Yeah. Willem, this is always your favorite part here at the end. I'm sorry we missed you. We really, we couldn't take care of you and like make sure you could get around today. But we did manage to save you a sweet treat as students here at Thetford Academy are doing some sweet learning. This is Windows of the Wild. Take care. So with that, we'll bid you adieu. I'm Willem Lang and I hope to see you again on Windows to the Wild. Support for the production of Windows to the Wild is provided by the Alice J. Reen Charitable Trust, the Fuller Foundation, the Gilbert Verney Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you.